Welcome back to another episode of Growing Green Thumbs with Portland Nursery, where new and seasoned gardeners can come together to talk about all things plants. This week, we're interviewing Jessica Fankin-Wood from Isley Nursery to talk a bit about plant combinations for your gardens. But before we dive into it, Katie has her weekly reminder about what growing zone we're broadcasting from and why that's something you need to keep in mind. Yeah, we're growing from uh, 8B here, so that's what you can grow with most of what we're talking about. And uh, so, Jess, welcome to the show. I did have a quick question about the zone. Uh, Isley is out in Boring. Boring's still zone 8B, right? Um, I'm not sure. I think I think it, I'm pretty sure it is. It's not as far away as I always think it is. Yeah. I mean, it's not that far out of Portland. It's like right, right on the edge. They get a little extra snow, but... Yeah, I wouldn't say... It doesn't seem like it's more than a few degrees colder than Portland, but, you know, I've really only been out there for the last four months or so, <laughs> so I'm not sure. That's okay. Maybe it's zone 8A instead of B. Very close relatives mm-hmm. of each other. So right, we should all be wise. talking about the same type of thing today. Right? Yeah, right yeah okay. I would think so. So Jess, you've been working with plants professionally in some capacity or another for around six years or so. Uh, but I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what initially got you interested in gardening, what you love about gardening, and what types of challenges you might have encountered early on. Well, I grew up at a nursery. Okay. Pretty much. My mom loves to garden. And as a child, we went to nurseries all the time because, you know, it was her passion as a child. Mm-hmm. You go everywhere with your mom, <laughs> right? So I think my mom used to take me to JC Penny all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Not nearly as exciting. Our car was always broken, so it was like the automotive shop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, then it sounds like I got lucky. <laughs> I spent so. a lot of time at Sperling Nursery in the Valley. Nice. Um, yeah. And it just, I never realized until I started working at a nursery and real found out that looked like my whole life was really just starting to revolve around plants. What a huge impact um, spending so much time there as a kid had made on me. What do you love about gardening? I like getting my hands dirty. Nice. Yeah. So I really came to gardening, not just from, you know, growing up with it, but um, after college, when Mm -hmm. I had lived a very sanitized life in the library Mm -hmm. and um, wanted to get back to know myself a little bit better Uh and I moved out of a dorm into a rental house where I wasn't allowed to dig anything up Mm. so I discovered Portland's wonderful community garden system oh okay nice Mm -hmm. and I got my first plot my first plot sucked it was (laughs) terrible (laughs) it was shaded it was under these big I think pie cherry trees that are massively overgrown. And so it was just this huge mess of roots. <laughs> um, yeah, it was a real struggle. Uh, but I did my best. And then as soon as I could move to a full sun plot mm-hmm. that just miraculously opened right up, you know, I was good to go. That's awesome. So mm-hmm. you really learned a lot from that experience, yes, I'm guessing. I what did. worked and didn't work. That's right. Cool. So um, building on that sort of background, can you tell us a little bit about your professional background? Oh, well, um, so having a plot at the community garden led to managing the community garden and running their produce for people program. Oh, neat. I've managed that garden for, I think it's about a decade now. And I do co-manage with... Um, two other awesome people Mm -hmm. these days which makes it a lot more fun we're a bilingual team which is really cool and it Mm -hmm. enables us to support an awesome diverse community of gardeners Mm -hmm. and I also got my um I did the OSU extension Mm -hmm. course yeah um and became a master gardener and then I ended up working at Portland Nursery and that's how we know you Mm -hmm. that's where I met all y'all <laughs> so <laughs> and now um, you're at isley and now i've moved on to isley what do you do over at isley well i'm a csr which it's not a very glamorous title <laughs> i'm a customer service representative um but essentially i support the sales rep for the west coast john andreessen 
Okay. So yeah, it's a, I mean, I've always wanted to work at a wholesale nursery. I love working out in the country. I love learning about conifers and my sales rep is a pretty cool guy. That's awesome. So speaking of conifers, uh, so is just for our listeners, is Isley primarily a conifer wholesale nursery? Yeah, for the most part. I mean, we do grow some other things like most notably our Japanese maples. Mm -hmm. We have a fabulous selection of maples that are, I mean, they're stunning. Um, But mostly we grow conifers. We grow some cornice, some dogwoods, a few other things like that. A lot of unique stuff that you Mm -hmm. can't find anywhere else. Right, but really um, Isley specializes primarily in conifers. And then um, they've developed a few different lines of maples. Cool. I always get excited when the Isley order comes in because I know I can go out and easily take a bunch of really fantastic photos of beautiful plants in like no time. I don't have to move them. I don't have to do anything. I just squat down next mm-hmm. to them and just start snapping away. And it's away. like already cool. And they, like it looks like a small miniature forest whenever I do it. It's just absolutely beautiful plants. And you can tell from a, like a mile away. I mean, they're really easy to spot. Right. That was my introduction to Isley, of course, was working with the product at Portland Nursery. And I was just always I mean the variety of different plants is amazing yeah you know, it's like they're all specimens you know so and they're just have this you know they're developed to a high standard mm-hmm. and they just look great right so yeah I you know really developed a respect for the nursery working at Portland nursery that's awesome Mm -hmm. so um like you said there's just so many different kinds and there's almost an endless numbers of ways to pair or combine plants in the garden um but not every one of them is like ideal or even advised like what makes a plant combination an effective one do you just go out into like a miniature forest and like oh that looks cool i want that well you know um you can have an all conifer garden that's just conifers Mm -hmm. uh the garden at (laughs) isley is actually is of course mostly conifers and it looks really cool but i would say for the home gardener you're going to want to combine your conifers with a variety of other plants um, so when I was working at Portland Nursery, mm-hmm. I often helped customers who were very anxious about creating plant combinations, you know. Maybe, they wanted to look perfect. Right. They just didn't trust their design sense. But it's actually, it's anyone can make awesome plant combinations. So I'd say when you're looking to create a plant combination, you first want to evoke a certain kind of feeling. You know, when you think about what you want to put in a space, why do you want to put stuff in that space? How do you want it to feel when you're there? You know, so what kind of vibe are you going for? Because different different plant combinations create different kinds of feelings. Maybe you're going for a more high energy kind of feeling. Um, that's something that you could create by using bright color, bright colorful material. Mm-hmm. Maybe stuff with a really sort of exuberant habit. You know that mm-hmm. has sort of more of a more energy to mm-hmm. the structure of the plant. Spiky things. Definitely right. feel high energy. People like those sort of tropical mm-hmm. look. Sort right, of. like really high contrast, like chartreuse and black, dark foliage, stuff like that. But maybe you're going for a more relaxing space. Often home gardeners seem to be looking for that, you know, stuff like lavender, I think. <laughs> Something that has a soft color, maybe a soft textured leaf, a fine textured leaf. When we were kind of talking to you in preparation for this show, I think in one of our emails, you mentioned a mood board. And <laughs> we actually had we had a guest on. Uh, we had our first ever phone in guest calling in from upstate New York uh, oh, a cool. little while back. Mm-hmm. And uh, she had mentioned a mood board. And it was the first time I ever heard this. And uh, I, I neglected to ask her exactly what that was on the show. So when you're coming up with like the feeling that you're looking for, the energy that you're looking for, is that where a mood board can kind of come into play? Or am I completely way off base on that? Actually, that would be a really cool um, sort of springboard for creating your plant combinations. Um, You could 
cut out different pictures of stuff that speaks to you. Mm-hmm. I mean, it could be, doesn't have to be pictures of plants. It could just be pictures of all in, kinds of different in things. In John's case, it would be cheese. Yeah. Yeah. Cheese. Yeah. It's the, the all cheese different board. Cheese <laughs> yeah. ah, ha, ha, ha. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. That would be a great starting point if you're not even sure what kind of feeling you want to evoke in a space. So, because usually, you know, at the nursery, we say, oh, I need some plants. But it's more about you than just about the plants. What do you like? Right. Yeah. Yeah. You're, I'll recommend things exactly. to people. But then they mm-hmm. will be like, oh, I don't know. And I'm like, no, it's not about my opinion. It's about like what right. you want to come out of your door and see every day. Yeah. Right. So this, you know, should encourage you to trust your judgment when you do select your plants. Because if the plants speak to you and it goes with the feeling you're trying to evoke... Yes. Why not? Yeah. yeah. You're probably, you know, going in the right direction. Okay. So in addition to creating a certain kind of feeling, you're looking for a plant combination that's dynamic. You're looking for all different kinds of things to see. It's kind of like the concept, design concept of layering to create a full, uh, like a full bed of plants. You want some background stuff, some mid-ground stuff, and then some foreground stuff Mm -hmm. so and by using a combination of different kinds of plants with different sizes different leaf shapes different textures different colors you're creating that visual layering Mm, okay that makes sense yeah also another super maybe one of the most important things about creating involved in creating a plant combination is cultural requirements Your, your plants all have to get along together you want if you is your site sunny is your your site shaded does mm-hmm. it have good drainage how are you going to be able to water it etc cetera, etc cetera. that's something really important to keep in mind so that your plants will be successful and happy where you so plant them no shade plants in next to like a cactus or mm-hmm. something like that right so plant things with similar needs together and i would also imagine like long term maybe trying to think ahead because the needs or like the space itself is going to change as those Mm -hmm. plants mature over time right so what once was a a a sunny area let's say 10 years down the road depending on what you've planted right could be shaded out it's true and that's the other thing about plant combinations and gardening in, in general is that it's constantly in flux you're creating living art so and plants have lifespans so you know maybe you plant a really small tree a small broadleaf tree Mm -hmm. um, and then you in a full sun area and then you surround it with sun loving perennials you know by the time that tree matures and gets much taller then those perennials will probably have expired and it will be time to replace them with more shade loving things so again going back to what we were talking about uh you know in preparation for this interview, one of the things that you mentioned was this idea of harmonious contrast, which when I first read it, almost sounded like a phrase that might be kind of fighting against itself, but it really isn't. And I was wondering if you could explain what you mean by that and how it relates to those effective combination elements you were just kind of talking about a moment ago. Okay, so awesome plant combinations are about contrast they're about combining different things so that they get along Um, using contrasting textures like Mm -hmm. textures determined by leaf shape and the density of a plant's habit Um, you know like smooth fuzzy rough etc etc uh-huh um congenial yeah. <laughs> Friendly. Friendly. You want to you wanna mix up different textures, different leaf shapes. Mm-hmm. You also want to mix up different plant sizes. So maybe this tree is more of a triangle shape. May, then perhaps you have a shrub that's more rounded. Then you have a, a ground cover that's low and creeping. Okay. Stuff like that. So this is all going to be part of the dynamism the dynamic quality of your plant combination. Mm -hmm. But you're putting all these different things together, like this daylily that looks so cool, this beauty bush with these pretty purple berries, things that bloom at different times of the season. What's going to combine all of those? Color, the harmony created Ah, through color. So you can use 
any combination of colors you want. However, there's got to be something in common between them. <laughs> the easiest hack I have for color combinations that I used over and over again at Portland Nursery was, do you like warm colors? Like orange, mm. yellow, red, mm -hmm. really vibrant stuff. Yeah. Or do you like more cool tones, like a soft blue, soft purple, soft pink, stuff like that. Yeah. So, and yes, you could use every different color in the rainbow. It's true. If you added elements to really bring home to people the rainbow theme, you could totally create a rainbow theme color combination. However, it will be far easier and it will be very visually effective if you pick two or three different colors and stick with it. So okay. multiple different things that have orange, multiple different things that have purple. And different shades within those mm -hmm. colors, right? Right. And if you pick all warm oranges or maybe all cool, soft, like light colored pink, mm -hmm. yes. You can connect all, many different plants um, with within the same sort of color spectrum. Okay, but it all has to like kind of draw the eyes. Mm -hmm. So, you're so seeing create it a as sense one. of harmony, Got right? Because you're looking for bringing all these different parts in your combination. Your combination that's made of multiple different elements. You need to be able to tie them together. So it has this cool balance of the dynamic and then this sense of unity. So I think that kind of strings it all together. Mm -hmm. okay. That's right. So you've put together three examples of plant combinations for us today. Um, and you're calling the first one, I'm going to butcher this maybe, the modern mugo. Mm -hmm. Is that right? The um, modern mugo pine. Oh, I, I see. say mugo or mugo. Mugo. It's Just say it Latin, really fast. Latin, it's a dead language. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe mugo isn't even Latin. I don't know. I'm going to get well, us in trouble. Well, it is pinus mugo. So... So can you tell us about the plants and why they work yeah. together in that combo? So for my combinations, I picked three rad plants that Isley offers, all of which are going to be available at the two Portland nursery locations um, this spring. And then I built combinations around them. For, so for this first one, the modern mugo pine, I think people have seen i'm sure lots of overgrown really rangy looking mogo pines around town perhaps right. at a gas station parking lot uh, that yes. have been <laughs> pruned aggressively and brutally over the years within an inch of their lives right this mogo pine the slow mound um it is just it's been well it's an isley plant it's developed by isley and it has it's, it's been bred to have a nice even habit and to stay small and compact so it's a beautiful soft curved um evergreen mount that you don't have to chop every no. like you are not mount. going to have to be doing pruning to control the size of this muco many conifers dwarf conifers like the ones in these combinations they grow pretty slowly mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that is certainly an investment of time and patience but it's worth it. It's totally worth it. It's nice. definitely low effort on your part. So you just need to water it and put it in the right place. Okay, so imagine this round sort of cupcake shaped mugo pine, the slow mound. That seems like on its own, not that exciting, right? Although it is evergreen. Mm -hmm. So it'll always be there in the winter when you look out into your wasteland of a yard <laughs> and you're looking desperately for color. I'm sure we all know how that feels at this time We had of an year. episode about that. Yeah. yeah. That's what my whole yard looks like. That's right. A so, wasteland. Oh, no. <laughs> well, you it's coming along. Yeah. It's coming along. That's why More he evergreens. Like, had this episode happen is so he could get some design. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Nice. I'm always ready. Yeah. <laughs> right. All right. So you have the Mugo Pine. Okay. What, what else is going to go with this one? So because this is something that stays a bit smaller, it gets to a f one foot tall by two feet wide in 10 years. And then at its eventual maturity, it will be about four feet tall, six feet wide. It's it's smaller. Mm -hmm. So I paired it with some smaller perennials. Now, one of my favorite grasses, and I love grasses for their movement, which evergreens, well, not all evergreens, but 
some evergreens lack movement, right? Mm -hmm. They're not quite, they're a more solid feeling. So it's perfect to pair them with grasses like this orange Carex, Carex testacea prairie fire. It is evergreen and it is this bright, vibrant, rich orange color. So it has sort of a, I don't know how to, Katie, how would I, you describe it's like it's uh, kind of fountainous in yeah, a little bit of a way. Right. It kind of sort of it's like a little orange fountain that's going to blow in the wind and it's going to be there all year round. Fountainous that's was perfect. That's the first time I've ever heard the word, but I think it's perfect. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? Yeah. I use that term all the time. Fountainous? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Let's go with it. Right. <laughs> but yeah. you know what I mean. I do. Yeah. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Great. Whew. Yes. Like Thank a fountain. You. Yeah. Okay. Right. It's like a fountain. Um, and. So to go along with that, you could use some other elements that also include orange. Oh, something I forgot to add to the mood board, but if you're looking for maybe some perennials that have orange flowers, you could do, it's it's erysimum, right? Uh, Wallflower. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mm -hmm. right. I think there's one called... Oh gosh, I wrote Bull's this. mauve is yeah. kind of mauve. Right. So not there's one, one called Apricot Twist. I think it's even fragrant. A lot of wallflowers are fragrant. There's another one called Winter Orchid. And that one is per- has purple and orange mm-hmm. tones to it as well. So one of the options. What's mm-hmm. another perennial option? Another there? perennial option would be something that blooms in summer. Um, the Coneflower. Oh my gosh. The flamethrower. Oh, it's that kind one's of a, a cool one. It's a big one. Y'all it's are going to have of, to like pause when we say all these names and look them up, listeners. It'll be worth it. I yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. I, it's hard. It's, I know I'm talking about something really visual on a podcast. You're doing a great job. We're, I'm trying. You're I'm painting a beautiful picture. I'm pictures. looking at the picture. Yeah. She gave us the pictures. <laughs> I just need your adjectives from both of you to help me. Okay. So... I think that orange goes really nicely with purple. And there is a lovely Hebe called Amy. I know it was a big, it was a just a fan favorite at Portland Nursery. Still this, is, yeah. Mm-hmm. And this is a has that broad leaf, rounded leaf texture that's going to contrast with the needly, the kind of sort of spininess, soft, softish. I don't know. It, it is. Kind of, it's, it's like a pokey cloud. Yeah, no, that's a great term, pokey right. cloud. Pokey You're cloud. learning all sorts of technical <laughs> terms here, John. Let's keep it up. I love it. <laughs> yeah, so this Hebe has a sort of a, not only does it have a purplish cast to the leaf, it's like a green-purple combination, it has beautiful purple flowers in the summer that are going to be a favorite of bees. So pollinator win, of course, the echinacea, that coneflower we mentioned earlier, also another pollinator favorite. Mm-hmm. And I guess this is a modern Mugo pollinator combo now. We also have this purple penstemon. Oh, yeah. Those penstemon do really raven. Well. One of my favorites. It's really juicy, purple, these huge flowers. Penstemon has this just, it's so long blooming. Mm-hmm. You cannot get better. I mean, it's Mine was blooming it's through profuse. Thanksgiving. Right. I mine think. is still just come totally green. <laughs> it's just doing its thing. I'm. It. Yeah. They just tend to endure. Um, right. So that, and you got some sedums in there too. Mm-hmm. It looks like. Yeah. And then if you want something for your sort of your ground plane, two different cool sedums. I mean, of course, there's just infinite sedums to choose from. But there's one called um, Sedum Album Orange Ice. Uh, a lot of sedums are going to sort of color up like with orange or red in the winter. And so this um, sedum album is going to be green through a lot of the year. But oh, then good. in the winter with the intensity, you know, of the it gets cold. Right. Mm-hmm. So then it's going to orange up in response to that sort of seasonal stress. Um, yeah, I just I really I'm a big fan of orange. I think. Once I just got hooked on that orange Carex, it was all over. It's so versatile and it's just energizing. Let's, uh, I think uh, we just got to keep an eye on the clock here a little bit. Let's get on to this second one that you have. Uh, I love all your names that you came up with, by the mm-hmm. way. <laughs> so we started off with a modern Mugo. We're moving on now to mm-hmm. the statement specimen. Okay, here's another amazing Isley introduction. This is the Camacypris obtusa, the dwarf Pinocchi cypress, um, the wild. 
very unusual name. It's actually an anagram. It's named by, um, it's named after two Dutch plantsmen, the while. So very unusual. And it's just a, I don't know. It's a, it's a dwarf Pinocchio with a real twist. It has this super sculptural habit the real dense foliage, the irregular branching almost looks like kind of twisted tongues. And for some reason, this uh, have the way the branches are on the plant, mm -hmm. it's like the that dark green color as the branches twist. It's it creates almost like this optical illusion type effect. It yeah. just sort of shimmers. It's very mesmerizing. I have loved this plant for many years so <laughs> it's stunning so this is definitely it's it's this architectural sort of sculptural plant mm -hmm. so you're probably not going to want to plant a hedge of these you're going to want one it's really... a statement piece right okay. exactly so okay. it's going to be like your big wow it would okay. look great in a container because it is slow growing and it has this unusual habit so at maturity it gets to about six feet high by two feet wide um, so it'd be fine in a container. And especially. that's, we're talking like years and years mm -hmm. and years it for takes, that size, right? Yeah. Although if you give conifers what they need and love, lots of sun, um, this one's going to need more moderate moisture and food. You know, when they're happy, they're going to grow more quickly. But of course, you will have to be a little bit more patient with it. So I, in my combination, paired um, this conifer with red and yellow colored plants. Um, I think this would look stunning with the lemon lime nandina, not your average red nandina. Right. Um, this one has this real zesty, super fresh green. It has more moderate size, three by three. You could also put it with um, a red twig dogwood. Actually, this is more of an orange, red, yellow twig dogwood midwinter fire for that winter interest. Mm -hmm. So you have the... So this, we've already had three different textures here, that bamboo-like leaf foliage of the Nandina, this, the, the bare branches of the cornice, they're the bare branches. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. So they're real spiky looking, really energetic with the orange red coloration. And then that camisipris is kind of like, I don't know. Just that green shimmer you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, that's right. It has sort of a solid kind of magical Feel mesmerizing i think you right. said <laughs> yeah sort of twist it's sort of twisty don't let it hypnotize you on yeah, the garden though yeah i was exactly. just gonna make a hypnotizing joke John. <laughs> somebody comes outside you haven't been in the house for like three hours you're just sitting there staring at it I, what perennials would you stick with it i'd probably put coreopsis hard working pollinator friend um i like the uptick series quite a bit real if they're not going to fall apart more small stature about a foot high a little bit bigger than a foot wide this one has big flowers with orange and then a real dark red eye to it um, of course you want to throw grass in there there's miscanthus little miss a very manageable size miscanthus that colors up beautifully in the fall real bright red leaf blades leaf blades Mm -hmm. That gives you another kick of texture. And then it's going to have these seed per seed heads that you can leave up all winter. They're like, they look sort of like corn silks. They're fluffy. Yeah, fluffy, soft, waving in the wind, giving you all the movement that conifers lack. Yeah. Right? So you have that good energy balance there. And then I think you could also throw in, I would say this is another fan favorite, Coluna vulgaris. Uh, firefly it turns this insane oh, Heather, yeah real bright red um, in the winter and it's just a total workhorse especially you know with our real dry real hot summers yeah yep. that's a great it's plant. just going to keep on going cool so yeah so that gives you multiple different textures all multiple different sizes all held together by the same uh, thread of color and the red and the orange running through that. Cool. And then um, lastly, you have the Primo planter. So can you quickly tell us what's going on in that? Okay, sure. Another adorable specimen conifer, Thuya occidentalis primo, eastern arborvi arbor 
Fight at Primo. You think you've seen Arborvitus before? Well, you've never seen an Arborvitus like this. <laughs> <laughs> it is has this just tiny little scal ultra ridiculously scalloped foliage. It almost looks crimped or something or like it's been piped you know it's like made of icing and been piped out it's just it's just I'm gonna so use unusual that. i'm gonna steal that and tell yeah, people that. It, yeah. <laughs> right so it's just it it definitely has a the fairy garden-esque look to it and it really is petite the scale of this plant is petite you know for this plant to tower over you 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 would need to be two inches tall so eventually um, at maturity it's going to be four feet high by one foot wide but until then it's an excellent i mean even then it's an excellent um choice for a full sun planter that of course has a hole in the bottom for drainage so this magical little fairy garden type tree I think it would look well i guess i'm thinking of spring combinations already yeah that's okay so there's this one real petite daffodil called is it tete-a-tete -tete? Tete -tete. Tete -tete. yeah uh -huh. yeah it's a little they're mini one little mini ones and they're just one of the first signs of spring for me and i love putting spring bulbs in planters so i think that would look really good here um you could also add in some of the sea thrift the armeria Mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. comes with white flowers and pink flowers and it has a it makes a sort of like a mat a mat of foliage mm -hmm. a mat of foliage that has a like a lanceolate shaped leaf like a what's it, long skinny little yeah tiny and it's leaves. evergreen which mm -hmm. is nice so yeah that's gonna contrast with this sort of scallopy foliage of the primo and it maintains that smaller scale appropriate to this little tree now i want to do something with gray because our other combinations have like gold and chartreuse with them mm -hmm. there is a lamb's ear ultimate texture plant super petable there's a mini one a mini one called silky fleece and i know portland nursery sells this uh, at least at some point during spring and summer fingers crossed so i remember fingers crossed no 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 <laughs> okay well we're not making any availability promises here but this is where i got to know this plant and i petted its leaves many times this is going to spill over the side of your planter you know so you have your primo for your thriller, your armeria, your sea thrift, and your daffodils for your filler, and then your lambs, mini lambs ears is more of a spiller. And what else makes me think of spring? Violas, smaller, oh, yeah. a little smaller than pansies. There's one particular one that I really like. Um, oh, I didn't write this series down, but it has more of a, it's kind of a orchidy purple color it's just really pretty it goes along with this cooler color palette here and then i think you could certainly throw in some semper vivum some hens and chicks oh yeah Often, they're really tough yep there's so many diff i mean it's you know i like to put annuals in my perennial planters always but and you know hens and chicks they're evergreen you can find fuzzy ones that have a more silvery cast to them and i think it would just yeah go in i think really it would well. go in here perfectly is it the deltini which one or the viola you were looking at oh no it's i think it's the sorbet oh I yeah say it's the sorbet series orchid might be those. Sorry, I'm, just, okay. I'm showing a All picture right. on my phone. I just so, took so some pictures of these the other day. There's so many, There's so many yeah. especially in that range of soft purples. You and know? you don't need the exact one. You no, know, you, you totally do. don't need the exact one. And that's the most important thing about these plant combinations is that your plant combination is an expression of you. You can't mess this up. Just do what feels right i could mess you. it up <laughs> <laughs> well you would plant like With cheese the, out there or something right yeah. well i don't really Easily I don't, distracted. please don't invite me to your stinky cheese garden <laughs> but although maybe i might have to experience something like that it's once worth it. in my life but i'd say if you follow the basic techniques of choosing um contrasting plant sizes and shapes contrasting textures and then you choose a harmonious 
color mm -hmm. palette. Um, limiting your colors is the trick to this. Just picking a couple that you really like. Mm -hmm. It's hard to go wrong. Okay. And if you make a decision you don't like, hey, Portland Nursery has an outstanding return policy. <laughs> and the people at Portland Nursery will always be happy to help you make your plant combinations. Thank you, Jessica. <laughs> so uh, real quick, uh, we're doing something new with all of our guests on the show this season that we didn't do last year. Uh, we sent out you know, a bunch of questions to you beforehand, but we reserved a few that we didn't want to ask you beforehand so we could see what Ooh. your answer was. It's not really a hot seat because they're pretty, they're pretty softball they're questions. You got yeah, it. it's okay. nothing too serious, but <laughs> they're going to come at you right now. Cool. Okay, so the first question is gardeners are always growing and learning and even making mistakes if you could go back in time and offer your younger self one piece of gardening advice what would it be keep it simple okay don't over complicate it i mean i i guess that's just kind of who i have been as a person but you know sometimes when you get really passionate about something and you're new to it you get too worried about following all the rules my you know my my introduction to gardening the when the first time I myself was a true gardener was as a vegetable gardener I read so many books there were so many different rules seems like sometimes everybody says something different mm -hmm. I got hung up on you know is this one or are these one or two inches of spacing going to make or break this cabbage crop just relax <laughs> just experiment <laughs> just follow the stick to the gardening basics right plant right place don't forget to water it amend your soil do pull weeds yes yes and, you'll and do then okay. enjoy it just relax Come on, you're gonna be okay it's a process gardening <laughs> is a process so and i mean you know that's why i say things like you can't go wrong when you make your plant combination is because it's gardening should be something is something to be enjoyed even when you make mistakes as you're doing it heck yes mm -hmm. love it um is there i can i take the second question John? do it yeah uh is there anyone who's influenced you as a gardener more than anyone else oh my gosh well i am almost done with my pcc design oh i have two people i'm almost done with my pcc design degree um like portland community college and I've had an outstanding professor named Jen Peters, who she's queen. Nice. She's the best. Um, I mean, her, you know, when you're creating designs, you learn through the feedback that your professors give you on your designs. And, you know, she'll just look at something I've done and say, you should move this over here. And it just changes my whole world. She's amazing. Nice. Um, I also, someone... When I, fr I first learned to vegetable garden, not just from books, but from the original manager who was there when I started at Barrydale Community Garden, he used to be a farmer and he also used to work in produce section of the supermarket, um, mm -hmm. wrangling all those vegetables. And he taught me, the first thing he taught me how to grow was potatoes. And then he taught me how to grow all kinds of other things in that produce for people plot where gardeners community gardeners would grow food to donate to the community mm -hmm. and yeah i just had never i don't know i mean it was just really special to have that knowledge passed to me and it's part of why you know i love passing on gardening knowledge to others oh that's so great yeah Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. One more. You're okay. doing okay so far. Okay. Yeah. All right. You're, you've got to answer. You. This yep. is good. <laughs> Thank you. Last one. All right. You wake up in the morning, you step outside, and you suddenly find yourself in the garden of your dreams. What does it look like? Roby's house. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, well, you know, I still haven't bought my first house, but... The garden of my dreams that I fantasize about right now, because my tastes are just always changing, right. is I would like to have a more wild country style garden that has quite a bit of shade. I'd like to have oh, larger trees and build beds underneath them. And I'd love it 
to be full of hellebores. Mm. So many hellebores. I just am crazy about hellebores. And it would also have a witch hazel in it because I just love that fragrance. I'm obsessed with the winter garden because that's the time of year that I need it the most. Mm, okay. So anything with winter interest, I mean, of course, I wouldn't want to have all shade, although there are many dynamic conifers for shade, and we should definitely do an episode about that. <laughs> yes. Hemlocks. We're not in our can't heads. can't beat them. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's just, you know, yeah. Oh, so there's shade just so garden many. garden with big trees. Yep, shade garden with some big trees. More In winter interest. Preferably more open shade. Um, but then it would also be nice to have some sun with all of my sun favorites, too. I think this, I think you got at least a B plus on that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think we're not you're, grading these, John. We're not grading these. Well, now, a plus all the way you're around. You're asking gardeners what plants, dream plants they want. Like we could have See, whole all episodes of them. about that. Maybe we should do that. <laughs> Jess, uh, it's always great. Uh, you don't work at the nursery anymore, so it, you, you are missed. I, I really enjoyed when I first got, uh, you know, to know you and was working with you kind of on the regular. It's really great to sit down with you again and pick your brain and hear you kind of talk and show your passion for plants a lot. It's it's awesome. Thank you. Class committee forever. Yeah. I'm never oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Let's keep it writing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we'd also like to thank TalkCast PDX for producing Growing Green Thumbs as well. We'll be back next week to talk about uh, what to do with your veggies post harvest, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Something along those lines. Yeah. Or I think we're going to roll a lot of stuff into that. But yeah, like you got a vegetable garden. What do you do with it now? I think it's great. Please remember that while Katie and our guests are here answering all of my plant questions, Portland Nursery is always available to answer all of your plant questions. Visit us today here in Portland, Oregon at 50th and Stark, 90th and Division. And we'll talk to you next week. Jess, honestly, thank you one more time. Thanks, oh, Jessica. Of course. It's my pleasure to be here. This was just a thrill. And it's wonderful to spend time with both of you. Thank you. Awesome. Life is just a long hangover. So great that you can't remember.